Hey, everybody, this is Chris Matman, and, and um, I'm not able to attend physically the TensorFlow Dev Summit, so I'm giving my talk remotely. Uh, my talk is about TensorFlow and machine learning from the trenches. I'm the deputy CTO at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and I'm going to talk about our experience using TensorFlow in the Innovation Experience Center at JPL. What's JPL? JPL is a federally funded research and development center. It's NASA's only FFRDC. They call these the National Labs. Its goal is to do first-of-a-kind uh, missions and autonomy, technology development for space, in situ on the ground, remote sensing of the Earth, and various other really nationally critically functions. It's nestled there in the beautiful mountains of uh, La Cunada Flint Ridge. We have about 6,000 employees, about a $2.6 billion business base. We have a pretty large facility, about 167 acres. At JPL, uh, I am the lead for the Innovation Experience Center. I'm the Deputy Chief Technology and Innovation Officer. And what does our Innovation Experience Center look like? Our recipe for it is to find the most difficult space, the space that looks the ugliest, and make it our own. Take it, gut it, have the actual engineers and data scientists put it together and put it back together in the way that they want. Sit, stand, desks. Um, basically follow the sun, shun shades, IoT internet devices that both frost and unfrost the conference room for smart glass and privacy, and so on and so forth. So that's our team. We're working in all of these areas, and we're really excited to be doing machine learning with TensorFlow. In particular, uh, we're excited in a few different areas. Our organization is responsible for using uh, TensorFlow in the following ways. The first is the M2020 rover that you just see right there. It's now named Perseverance. In that rover, in that clean room, we measure particulates in the air to determine if that we're adding any sort of biocontamination, because we don't want to do that. When we send this to another planet, if we discover life, we actually want to do that. So we have small uh, commodity IoT, Internet of Things sensors that are measuring particulates, increasing our ability to do that, increasing the density of the measurements that we have. And we're doing predictions using TensorFlow and machine learning to determine the next measurements, the next contaminations if we had them and intervening if necessary. In the bottom right, you see our people counter. That's another IoT device. It uses TensorFlow and object detection and facial recognition and so forth to basically count people's heads as they go in and out of our tents at events like our IT Expo and so forth so that we can tell people when the right times to actually attend these events so that they're not overcrowded. Besides that, we're not just doing institutional things with TensorFlow. We're looking beyond that. Today, our Mars rovers are currently running um, on what's called the RAD 750 processor. That's a radiation-hardened PowerPC 750-like processor. That's basically the amount of power that we had on an iPhone 1. Tomorrow, we'll have the ability to have high-performance spaceflight computing and the ability to use things like Snapdragons from Qualcomm, so real GPU, like a deep learning chips so that we could do actual computing on board. And if we could do a high-performance space-like computing on board, we could do really cool things like make the rovers intelligent, make our rovers smart, do things like drive-by science, which you see there highlighted in the right as one of our three ongoing tasks and initiatives to use and leverage high-performance space-like computing. Um, can we make rovers smarter? Absolutely we can. In particular, we can take models like terrain classifiers, which we've built with TensorFlow. We call it Spock. There's a theme here, it's Star Trek. Um, our terrain classifier Spock is a CNN. It's a convolutional neural network using TensorFlow to do terrain classification, ripples, smooth, smooth with rocks, to figure out where the rover should drive and where it shouldn't. We test this in our Arroyo Seco, which is right by JPL, using our test Athena rover. Another TensorFlow-based model that we've been using and leveraging is um, the Google Show and Tell model for that, which is a combination of a convolutional neural network and LSTM or recurrent neural network, long short-term memory, to basically do labeling, figure out the labels for a particular image for the rover, and then take the labels and actually learn a sentence description for it so that scientists can review them, and so that the rover, when it's on Mars, can instead of sending back 200 images a day to plan what to do the next day, it can send back millions of image captions that are scientifically validated and to increase our density of observation. We, In terms of our terrain classifier, just some examples of that. Spock looks at the geometric features and so forth, and it's actually capable of recognizing terrain types from images. So this is really important both for Mars surface operations, but also to potentially plan where we should do future Mars missions and landings. 
Beyond that, one of the things we've been really challenged with, and it's been a big area of research for us, is putting TensorFlow models and taking them and porting them to TensorFlow Lite and moving them onto exotic hardware, some of which isn't even physically here and we only have emulators for, like the high-performance spaceflight computing emulator that we've been trying to look at various TensorFlow models like Deep Lab, MobileNet V2, and then figuring out how do we port them into a TensorFlow Lite quantized model or TensorFlow Lite floating point model and measuring the computation time from that. One of our key observations here is that MobileNet V2 tests were conducted on smaller imagery and actually MobileNet V2 tests performed the fastest of any of the models that we were actually testing when we used TensorFlow Lite in a quantized fashion for that. So we've got ongoing research and we're working on porting these models into these TF Lite environments. In particular, if we have drive-by science, if our rovers are smarter and you look on the right, we don't want to miss that unnoticed green monster problem where the rover simply doesn't have enough power to be able to, um, and, and light time and bandwidth, it, it misses recognizing something that actually we really wanted to see, like our little buddy right there in green. And one of the challenges with that is that the rover has an eight minute light time from round trip from Earth to Mars to basically send it a communication and to hear back from it. So it's got to do a lot of science and things on board. It's got to recognize things even without human intervention. Additionally, our geologists, they've got a headache with too many images and so forth. So having the ability to have the rover be smart, do drive-by science on board, and just send back, again, those textual captions and descriptions of images is really key because then it can get beyond only being able to send 200 images per day and could actually send millions of captions. In particular, all the work that we're doing on TensorFlow in the book, I've been collecting it, I've been capturing it, and I'm writing a second version uh, of the Machine Learning with TensorFlow book. It's called Machine Learning with TensorFlow 2nd Edition. It's currently in the Manning Early Access Program, or MEET. MEEP, please check out the link right there, and I would love for you to, you know, basically ask me any questions. There's an online developer forum for it. Please let me know, and uh, I'd be happy to get back to you. And you know what? I'm not there physically, but you can find me online at Twitter, Chris Matman, at Chris Matman, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to present today. Oh.